I'd like to thank you all for being here. I know you have an enormously busy schedule, and uh, it is a pleasure to see that you were able to make time over lunch to come and uh, talk a little bit or listen a little bit about uh, Israeli-Palestinian issues. The way I want to look at it, as defined in the title, is looking at it the way a strategic thinker would look at it. And that's not always the way that, uh, that people in the media, uh, that various other speakers uh, in a more civilian setting would look at it. But I think it's important to think about this not just as an important regional um, ish set of issues, but also as an uh, example and perhaps something you can look at with ideas to methodology and planning and some ideas of how you can um, look at this the way a strategic thinker does and maybe look a lot under the surface. Let's see. Um, and when we're talking about this, uh, some of the pitfalls that I feel that people fall into, th there's no easy solution to the Israeli-Palestinian issue. There's a lot of very brilliant people have been working on this for, for you know, the last a hundred or so years, uh, going back to, you know, the Balfour Declaration and, and and even before that, and if it could have been solved easily, it would have been solved a long time ago, and so this is a, a, a situation where we are faced with a truly difficult problem. No easy solutions, analogies, how to handle it through analogies, which are frequently used, um, need to be employed uh, with great care. And the news media, especially television, has to make this uh, type of information available to a mass audience, and often that involves simplifying it. And that's okay for a mass audience. But as a strategic thinker, you're going to be looking at this with a lot more nuance, a lot more subtlety, and understand uh, some of the things beyond the immediate issues and the immediate slogans. Um, and then I get to my third point here. Some problems cannot be solved in the short term. Frankly, when I put this slide together originally, it said some problems cannot be solved. But um, I decided to be, you know, not to hit you with my um, particular wellspring of pessimism uh, developed after dealing with this conflict for 30 years and um, to, uh, to sort of point out that uh, the idea that every problem has a solution and if, you know, the very American idea, if you haven't found the solution yet, you're just not trying hard enough, well, some problems don't have solutions or at least they don't have easy solutions. And I don't want to fall into fatalism and say it doesn't have a solution and it will never have a solution. That's going a little too far. But I do want to say that sometimes you have to realize the difficulty of the problem you're dealing with and the idea that you're not going to be able to solve it. One thing I utterly hate, by the way, is whenever commentators, and of course we've got a whole plethora of them now, they, they grow like mushrooms, uh, commentators on television, when they talk about whether President Obama or President Bush is going to address the Middle East uh, issue, address Israeli-Palestinian issues, they say, well, he probably can't solve it, so he best do nothing. And that kind of dichotomy, that kind of rigid thinking, either solve it or do nothing, because you don't want to try to solve it and fail, because then you look horrible, um, can, get, can make things a lot worse. Because why some problems can't be solved they can always get worse. And so that leaves you with the possibility that what you're going to be faced with is managing the problem, containing the problem, preventing the problem from getting worse. Maybe we don't like everybody in the Palestinian uh, leadership, but we'd probably be a lot more unhappy if that leadership was replaced and the Palestinians found their allegiance granted to, say, someone like Osama bin Laden. That would be worse. These things can always get worse. And if you don't manage them and don't pay attention to them and don't work with them, you're going to have the real possibility 
that they're not going to get a whole lot better on their own. That doesn't mean, by the way, that the first thing the president should do is rush over to the Middle East and put his prestige on the line and try to knock heads together um, and try to come up with some instant solution. What it does mean is that the United States international community, the, the quartet, the UN, the EU, all of us who are interested in peace need to try to stay involved and need to help and need to try to do what is doable. Okay? Okay, so where do we start? This is where we start. Two-state solution, that's a Palestinian state. That is an international consensus and also um, as I say, it's a consensus in this country. President Bush agreed with the idea of a Palestinian state. Now, the devil is in the details here, but nevertheless, that was agreed. That was something he put out. President Obama has said the same thing, a Democratic and Republican consensus on a Palestinian state. Palestine Authority, Palestinian Authority, excuse me, has said that uh, they also support a Palestinian state, and of course, for a while, they were in the, back in the 90s, um, when I was on the West Bank, I saw real progress towards state building, uh, real, real, real forward movement. Now, we've gone into a much worse period now, but the idea that there would eventually be a Palestinian state was underlying a lot of, um, a lot of the effort going on there. Prime Minister Netanyahu of the Likud party, so one of the more conservative figures in Israeli politics, agrees with a Palestinian state. Now, he doesn't agree with this happily, and I think if you said there was some arm twisting there, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with you. Uh, and he has a lot more caveats uh, in terms of a demilitarized state and other, other sorts of things, but that nevertheless is something that he's uh, perhaps under pressure agreed to. Well, who doesn't agree is Hamas. Uh, Hamas is a large and important Palestinian political party slash terrorist group. And if you look at Hamas, it does not formally accept a two-state solution and um, at least doesn't directly, linearly, um, openly accept it. And uh, that means that Hamas has largely remained outside of the negotiations process. I have been many places uh, in front of Arab audiences talking and um, if I had a dime for every unfriendly question I got on similar topics, I'd you know, be on my private jet flying to Bermuda, and we'd do this by, by, you know, um, by video conference. But the, uh, one of the questions I frequently get is, doesn't the United States just refuse to work with Hamas because the United States is anti-Muslim, anti-Islamic, won't work with an Islamic party? I say, no, the United States has made some conditions fairly clear, and one thing is to be part of the peace process, you have to accept a two-state solution. Well, then I get a variety of answers, including, well, there was an agreement in Mecca, and uh, this agreement has long since fallen apart, uh, but they agreed to work with Fatah, and Fatah supports a, a two-state solution. So they didn't object to it at the time. Um, President Jimmy Carter spoke to uh, Khalid Mashal, the head of the political department of Hamas, and he made some fairly moderate statements about the possibility of not having total control over all of historic Palestine. And I say, listen, you agree to accept a two-state solution? Do it in a way that's straightforward, I accept a two-state solution, we'll talk, about the, we'll talk about the details later, and do it in a way that's not something you can say to me, you've accepted a two-state solution, and then you can say to somebody else, we didn't. I don't want you to accept a two-state solution in a deniable way, and then actually expect a whole lot of people to take that seriously. As I say at the bottom of that slide, Many of the Israelis don't take any of these Hamas statements very seriously. They consider it all to be just a, a public relations exercise. That may be a little harsh, and there are some Israelis um, who, who see it very differently and would like to negotiate with Hamas. One of them is um, Ifram Halavi. Maybe some of you have read his book. He's the former head of Mossad. He wrote a 
heck of a good book about, if you like spy stories and espionage, called, uh, called Man in the Shadows, but, and, and some others like that. But um, in any event, this is sort of the, the framework we're talking about when we talk about, um, when we talk about uh, the current state of the peace process. Okay. Now here are some of the current difficulties, and they're big difficulties. Palestinian Authority, which is the group of Palestinians, the Palestinian leadership that wants to negotiate with Israel under certain conditions, we'll get to that in a second, under certain conditions they will negotiate with the Israelis. And the Palestinian Authority uh, doesn't control all of the Palestine Palestinian territories. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means they're negotiating and they have control of the West Bank. That's the largest of the Palestinian territories. But they do not have control of the Gaza Strip. So you're dealing with a divided government that has a political rival installed in a significant portion of the Palestinian territory. Therefore, if you make a deal with them, you've essentially made a deal that they can enforce or they can agree to or they can follow up on on the West Bank but not in the Gaza Strip. And it's hard to make a deal with a group that doesn't have any authority over some of the issues that you're trying to address. So that's a problem. There's also this, and there are as many names for this, by the way, and they're all loaded names, um, for the separation barrier that's partially built and being completed along the West Bank. As the problems with terrorism increased uh, in the aftermath of the failure of the um, Second Camp David initiative, that's when President Clinton met with Arafat and uh, Ehud Barak and they tried to work out a second agreement. They came real close, but, but they did not make it. And after that, we had a new intifada, a new uprising among the Palestinians. It was a more violent uprising than the first intifada. The first intifada tended to be a lot of rock throwing and, 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 and some Molotov cocktails, but it, it tended to be heavily weighted in favor of non-deadly force. And of course, this changed in the second intifada where we had a lot more suicide bombings. People cross over to Israel um, with a suicide bombing vest filled with explosives and ball bearings. And as part of the way of addressing this, the Israelis said, we've got to control the territory a little better, control the borders, and we're going to put up this separation barrier. Um, the separation barrier, of course, did not narrowly follow the 1967 boundary and instead reached out into the West Bank. So it reached onto some Palestinian territory. Different, um, different figures that I've seen, bear in mind the wall is not completed, the separation barrier is not completed, um, have said that there could be as much as 15% of the West Bank. Some have even said, and this, I think this is an exaggeration, 25%. That's, Avi Shalem's book, Israel and Palestine. Avi Shalem is a brilliant scholar. Uh, I was mentioned I wrote a book on Jordan. Uh, Avi Shalem wrote a book on the king, of the, the king of Jordan who's had the most years in office, King Hussein, called Lion of Jordan. It was about 1,000, 1,200 pages long. Brilliant book. Uh, but he is a, a fairly left-wing Israeli author. So he comes up with this uh, 25, up to 25 percent. That seems a little steep. But nevertheless, no one disputes that this is not running along the 67 borders. So there is Palestinian land that's going to be behind the barrier, and that's just assumed uh, by many Palestinians that's going to be annexed. This is, that's why they call it the annexation wall. They call it a lot of other things that are probably not uh, uh, terms that the Israelis would use for it, uh, the Berlin Wall, things like that. Um, but uh, in any event, that, uh, that's, that's a problem right now in, in terms of, it's another item of disagreement and unhappiness between the, um, the, the, different, uh, the different parties to the conflict. Um, likewise, we have an expansion. This right now, it's a partial expansion of West Bank settlements uh, right now, that has been 
limited to Jerusalem, and it has been has a time limit on it to, till September. It was a temporary suspension of settlements that Prime Minister Netanyahu agreed to after um, hard discussions with President Obama. So whether this expires and we see more settlements built, uh, if you want to count the suburbs of Jerusalem, we've got half a million, um, half a million Israeli citizens uh, in the West Bank in, in settlements and, and such. Uh, so, you know, it's a lot of people. And it's assumed by the Palestinians that they are being placed there as the groundwork to annexing a lot of that territory to Israel. So that is an issue. Um, differences exist about Jerusalem. This morning, um, the Israelis tore down a Palestinian house. Now, it didn't have a building permit. The Palestinians claim, and I don't really doubt them, that they can't get building permits to build in Jerusalem. But they did tear down a, a finished Palestinian house, a shack really, and a couple of unfinished Palestinian homes. And that just led to a cancellation, postponement, not a cancellation, postponement of talks between Prime Minister Netanyahu and the President of Egypt. So one house gets demolished and already it's gone up to the head of state level. And um, that's how sensitive Jerusalem is. And yet the Israelis now are talking about demolishing a number of illegal, true, illegal Palestinian dwellings. No one got a work permit to build them. And uh, replacing them with various other uh, types of structures, including a theme park honoring King David of Israel, or way old Israel, biblical Israel and um, talking about authorizing lots more Jewish housing in Israel in districts that have traditionally, neighborhoods traditionally been Palestinian in East Jerusalem. Um, and so you have what the Palestinians in that area fear is a, is a creeping annexation where they're, they're not allowed to build, they're not allowed to do anything, and Israel has simply defined the, the city as its capital, and that's defining Palestinian rights in Jerusalem sort of out of existence as far as they're concerned. So the Palestinians and the Israelis have real differences over that. And like I say, a shack got demolished today and it's gone up to the head of state level. So you're seeing how, how sensitive that item can be. Uh, one of the problems, by the way, that we see when we look at the Israeli-Palestinian issue is that a lot of people who are commenting on it seem to comment it on it as though it's in a vacuum. Like the Israelis and the Palestinians are fighting over some island in the middle of nowhere and it doesn't affect anybody else or no one else is interested. Um, I think we know others are interested, but um, some nations, it's pretty close to their top foreign policy priority and uh, they're one of their top, at least, foreign policy concerns. And we look at two nations that are especially involved. This is Egypt and Jordan. Egypt and Jordan both have peace treaties with Israel. The Egyptian peace treaty, as you can see, is a lot older peace treaty. It goes back to 1979, March 1979, uh, signed by uh, President Anwar Sadat before he was assassinated. And then we have the Jordanian peace treaty that came along much later, and that, uh, that came along shortly after the Oslo process, when the Palestinians started negotiating with the Israelis, and Yasser Arafat could shake hands with Yitzhak Rabin in public, then Jordan could do it. I mean, the king of Jordan had known Yitzhak Rabin for 20 years, but it was all behind the scenes, all secret, all deniable. Well, now that Arafat's meeting him, King of Jordan can do it, do it too. And um, under King Hussein and Yitzhak Rabin, Jordan and Israel actually had a, a pretty good relationship. Uh, King Hussein actually considered uh, Rabin to be one of his close friends and, and, and treated him like that, and it was pretty much reciprocal. So uh, when he was cried at, at Yitzhak Rabin's uh, funeral and said he lost a brother. That wasn't affected. That was real. Uh, they, were, they were actually very friendly. And um, 
King Hussein was willing to do things like when there was a um, when there was an incident, a terrorism incident, where somebody snuck across the border from Jordan and killed some people, he went over to Israel and apologized for it. Said, you know, I, I'm sorry. I, we were watching the border as best we could, but I'm just, I'm just here to show my respects and show how aggrieved I am about what happened. And, and that, that was pretty new for an, for, for an Arab ruler. Um, we now have a new king, and I say new in parentheses because he's been king for over 10 years, but because <coughs> King Hussein was king for almost, well, well over 40 years. Um, then he, this poor guy, 10 years into it, he still gets called the new king, King Abdullah, uh, King Hussein's oldest son. And King Abdullah is a little less friendly with the Israelis because it's a harder time. It's a harder time to be friendly. So he'll give a few interviews and he'll, he'll talk to people and certainly He's paying attention, but you don't get the kind of personal warmth. You can't say King Abdullah has a close personal friendship with Phil in the Israeli uh, policymaker in the same way you could say that King Hussein had a close friendship with Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, King Abdullah is simply not going to cry at anybody's funeral. He might be sad, but it's not going to hit him at the same emotional level uh, as, as Yitzhak Rabin's assassination hit King Hussein. So, um, Jordan has the warmest relationship, but it's a little more distant now. Um, and when there are settlements being built in the West Bank or when there are changes being taken place to Jerusalem, that tends to get a lot of people in the Jordanian public stirred up. And so King Abdullah has to, you know, be careful to, on the one hand, maintain good relations with Israel because that's important to him. And on the other hand, not, um, not look so friendly that he approves of some of these actions that the public in Jordan is unhappy about. Uh, Jordanians are most concerned, frequently concerned, uh, that there may be a resuscitation of this idea of Jordan as Palestine. In other words, the, the Jordanian citizens are, 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 in essence, Palestinians. About two-thirds of them may, in fact, um, be considered Palestinian of Palis Jordanians of Palestinian heritage, and that since there are so many Palestinians that all want a state, maybe they should just have Jordan as a state. And what the king of Jordan fears, or at least seems to be really upset about, is when these statements are made in public, as they were at the most recent Knesset when it, when it first came to power after the Netanyahu, uh, Netanyahu's election. Netanyahu did not say this. But uh, some members of the Knesset, Israel's parliament, did. Jordan is Palestine, and oh boy, that set off the uh, skyrockets, because um, the idea then becomes: Well, what if they start encouraging mass transfer? What if we have uh, millions plus Palestinians overwhelm the country? We don't have the economic resources, and right now we have a we have a demographic balance between former Palestinians and. Transjordanians, Jordan, uh, Jordanians from the East Bank, uh, who are who are much more uh, tribal in orientation, have a different outlook than the Palestinians, and those those people are often the most loyal to the to the Hashemite monarchy. So what you've got under those circumstances is some real fears in Jordan. Um, okay, so just trying to sort of suggest here that. Um, you know, do be aware that a whole variety of states believe they have a stake in this. It's not just the Israelis and the Palestinians. And some states, like Egypt and Jordan, perhaps have, a, have an especially significant stake. Well, there's the other state that's involved, uh, United States. And um, right now, the United States is trying to become more involved in the peace process. Uh, they've sought a f settlement freeze in the West Bank, and we've got something that's going to last till September. Whether that's extended or not, we'll see. And uh, we've got something that, uh, there, while there is a settlement freeze, it does not include Jerusalem. And uh, Israelis say Jerusalem's not a settlement. Jerusalem's our capital. Palestinians say we have just as much historic right to Jerusalem as you do, and, and the conversation declines from there. Um, We've engaged in proximity talks as well. Proximity talks are when countries aren't talking to each other. We sort of talk to one and talk to the other and talk to one, talk to the other. Um, that's supposed to last until September. 
Uh, former Senator George Mitchell is um, involved in that. A close friend of mine is his chief aide. And whether or not the proximity talks continue remain to be seen. Um, clearly, that's not the best solution. And neither side particularly likes it. And both sides, but especially the Israelis, fear that the proximity talks are going to decline into not real talks, but efforts by the Palestinians in this case, or the Israelis in the other case, to convince the Americans that they're right. In other words, I'll go say, what do you want to say to the Israelis? Well, I want to say to the Israelis, and essentially I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you, Senator Mitchell, about how unhappy I am with the current situation and how the United States should intervene to say it. Well, that's not what are you saying to the Israelis, that's what are you saying to the United States. And so there's been a lot of complaints about these. The problem is, is that uh, Netanyahu said very clearly uh, he's willing to talk face to face to, uh, to Abbas, to Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the um, Palestinian uh, Authority, or Salam Fayyad, the uh, prime minister. But, um, but the Palestinians are not prepared to talk to the Israelis right now unless the Israelis promise to stop building settlements. And the Palestinian case for that is that if we're going to be talking to the Israelis, they can't be changing the, uh, the, uh, the situation on the ground while we will sort of waste time until they stall us and then they present us with a fait accompli of expanded settlements and there's no way they can ever provide uh, much more than X percentage of the West Bank to a Palestinian state. So that's the deadlock that we've, we've got right now. Um, and I put on the third bullet, um, Israeli, um, Palestinian, uh, excuse me, Israeli-American relations now appear to seem better, and that's um, something that we saw in the uh, recent discussions between Prime Minister Netanyahu and uh, President Obama. They were both friendly. You know, they couldn't stop shaking hands. You know, press always notices trivialities, and so they had to had to pay attention to that. But there was this kind of ultra-friendly, uh, we love you to pieces sort of uh, atmosphere. And um, that's fine, and things are better, and some issues have been improved. Some, I, I would say, secondary issues, but we've got a fourth round of sanctions against Iran through the United Nations. Now, there's a lot more to do with regards to stopping Iran from building a nuclear weapons, but the Israelis are appreciative. Um, I'm not sure that an Iranian nuclear weapon is truly directed at them, but it could be, and um, especially it would be a, a counter value target if the United States attacked Iran. Iran can't reach the United States, so who are they going to attack? Well, that's Israel, or Saudi Arabia, or somebody, but not the United States to be a U.S. ally. So I Israel does, um, does appear very happy that a fourth round got through. We're seeing that the Russians under um, President Medvedev uh, are now saying harsher things about the Iranians than they've ever said before. Now that doesn't mean they're on a level with what Israel has to say about Iran or what we have to say about Iran, but they're harsher than the Russians have ever said before. And of course the Iranians being Iranians, um, you know, can't can't deal with that, so they, you know, if somebody mildly criticizes them, they respond by harshly insulting them. And the, um, you know, the, the president of Iran, uh, Ahmadinejad, um, chooses to say all sorts of ultra-harsh things, and then that doesn't really improve the relations between Russia and Iran either. Um, Problems with Turkey, we've all seen the problems with Turkey as a result of that uh, activist ship that got stopped um, about three weeks ago. Nine people got killed, um, and uh, nine, nine activists got killed uh, in an Israeli commando raid. The Israelis have conducted an investigation of that now. But um, the Turks are white hot angry over it. They have a mildly Islamist government there under uh, Prime Minister Erdogan and um, President Abdullah Gol, and they're talking about breaking relations with Israel. And Turkey 
for a while was a very important ally of Israel in the Middle East, so this is something that is disturbing to the Israelis. But uh, that may be pulled back from the brink. If it does get pulled back from the brink, there's probably some United States involvement in doing that. The, uh, the Turks are perhaps less interested in Israel, maintaining good relations with Israel than they used to be, but they are uh, still darn interested in maintaining good relations with the United States. So there's, there's that too. Um, and the U.S. also on our side appreciates the relaxation of the blockade of Gaza, which I will talk about right now. And the blockade of Gaza takes us back to one of the thornier problems of the situation, Israeli-Palestinian situation, where you have um, you had a divided government. And you see right now that we have a divided government in the form of Palestinian uh, elections. And I've talked about that a little. Produced, uh, uh, produced a, the Palestinian uh, elections of 2006 were parliamentary elections. And the Hamas government, or the Hamas political party, won those elections. Now, that doesn't mean that they had total power because you still had a president from the other political party, the moderate political party, Fatah. But um, you now had divided government, and the, um, the, uh, the parties could not work out their disagreements. And so what ended up happening, as I mentioned, Hamas seized control of the uh, Gaza Strip and basically um, Eva you know, uh, evacuated or killed leading Fatah members, and so you have these two different, um, these two different Palestinian entities now. That led to the blockade. Egypt and Israel were both involved in the blockade. The Egyptian position on this um, is sometimes uh, is sometimes not widely known, but the Egyptians were just as unhappy with Hamas as um, as the Israelis. And in fact, Hamas uh, goes back to the, um, it, re it grew out of the Egyptian opposition group, Muslim Brotherhood. And um, if you ever talk to any establishment Egyptian about the Muslim Brotherhood, they seldom have any good thing to say, and they certainly don't have a lot of good things to say about Hamas. Whenever my Israeli friends at the Track 2 talks want to try to make a point about how horrible Hamas is, thing they do is say, did you listen to ambassadors from Egypt? Did you hear them? Wow, you know, I mean, we couldn't have said it any better. And I'll tell you, they couldn't have said it any clearer because, um, because this is of concern to, 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 to Cairo as well as to, to the Israelis. Um, further complication then, Israel briefly invaded uh, Gaza in December of 2008, last few days of December in 2008. Most of the fighting was in January 2009. Had a lot of casualties. I, I believe it was about 1,400 Palestinian casualties. Um, thir 13 Israelis died. So it was, um, it was lopsided, uh, at least if you believe the uh, international organizations that were doing the monitoring. And uh, a lot of infrastructure damage, tremendous, tremendous suffering, I understand. I've been to Gaza, but not recently for kind of obvious reasons. So um, in, in any event, um, the United States then uh, supported Fatah, Palestinian Authority, uh, and in, in it, it had previously kind of not provided as much. The bigger problem Hamas becomes, the more the United States seems to support Fatah. And of course, uh, some of you know about General Dayton, Lieutenant General Dayton's mission where he was training Palestinian police. I've, I've even met a variety of people who've served with him. So, um, in, in any event, the United States is, is uh, getting involved in that in that way. And out now as a result of the blockade um, being, being um, challenged uh, by that Turkish ship, um, there's been some reevaluation. The Israelis have relaxed their blockade, allowing certain goods in, but not out. And the Palestinians have um, also had a big break as far as the uh, 
Egyptian border is concerned. The Egyptian border has been significantly relaxed. Um, I don't know what changes that's going to make because you had so many tunnels going through from the Egyptian side of the border that virtually anything you could get, you could get smuggled. So um, that made a difference too. I think I'm going into too many anecdotes, so I don't want to run out of time on you. I do want to give you some time for questions. Uh, but there's the key Arab states have their views on Hamas. And um, as I say, Egypt, establishment Egypt, government Egypt, uh, just absolutely furious about Hamas. And that's something that's not widely known. And I, I just say that because as a strategic thinker, it's real easy to think of Egypt being outside of this. It's, it's easy to think of Jordan as being outside of this. This is a Palestinian-Israeli issue. The Palestinians and the Israelis, if you can work on them to the point they can reach some agreement, well, that's everybody else should follow. And that may not be the case. And as a strategic thinker, you've got to kind of got to be aware of these second order events. Um, Jordanian government does not like Hamas. Uh, the most powerful political party in Jordan is an opposition party uh, called the Islamic Action Front that grew out of the Muslim Brotherhood just as Hamas grew out of the Muslim Brotherhood, so they have common roots. The Jordanians don't ever want to see the Islamic Action Party militarized and carrying weapons and doing things like Hamas does. And so Hamas is seen as A, a bad example, and B, um, if the IAF is so involved that they're thinking about Hamas all of the time, you're liable to get Jordan dragged into confrontations it doesn't want to be dragged into. So uh, Jordanian leadership is not thrilled with Hamas. Uh, the people that are thrilled with Hamas are the Iranians, and they don't have a problem with Hamas. Uh, and in fact, um, have tried, and oftentimes it's been, been difficult to get resources through to Hamas, to get money through to Hamas. Sometimes the Israelis intercept it, often the Israelis intercept it, not all the time. So that can make a, a, significant, uh, a significant difference. Um, Islamic feud, Hamas and Al Qaeda. Remember how I said things can always get worse? This is how they can get worse. Hamas is not a liberal organization. Hamas practices terrorism. Hamas does a lot of bad things, and we have a lot of good reasons for not liking Hamas, and yet things can get worse. Um, Hamas is an organization that is viewed with contempt by Al Qaeda. And they view them as being so soft and so wimpy that they are just... Um, they're just, you know, right on the pinnacle about to commit treason. Um, Fatah, which is, which is negotiating with the Israelis, they've already betrayed the Palestinians, according to bin Laden. And so here we have um, Ayman al-Zawahiri, the number two, is especially uh, vindictive in his denunciation of Hamas. Part of that is his own history. He himself was very familiar with and initially part of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And he really feels he knows these guys to be the weak and pathetic organization that always gets uh, kicked in the teeth uh, in the final round. So he doesn't have a lot of use for Hamas. He's hoping that the more radical wing of Hamas, the most radical people within that organization can see the light and will join uh, some of the Al-Qaeda affiliates that do exist in the Gaza Strip. Um, Hamas, correspondingly, within the Gaza Strip, has not shown a lot of tolerance and a lot of friendliness towards the Al-Qaeda affiliates and the way they organize and such. Uh, it's probably um, not surprising that the Hamas uh, internal security forces help those people make their way to jail because they see this as, as, as something that's dangerous uh, to them and to their rule. Um, bin Laden, if he found a bottle with a genie in it and had to start going over wishes, one of his wishes would certainly be that Al-Qaeda takes possession of the Palestine, Palestine issue. If bin Laden can be the speech of opposition, if bin Laden can be the focus of 
uh, the demand for Palestinian rights, you've made his century. I mean, that's the, that's the big issue in Middle East politics, and bin Laden would love to be seen as the chief spokesman. That is a problem, however, for him, um, because uh, basically that means that the Palestinians have to sign up for this very radical figure who not only uh, has, uh, con has uh, inflicted mass terrorism against a variety of actors, including the United States, but they also fear that their cause is going to get subsumed in all these larger jihadist issues of restoring the caliphate. And before nothing, uh, before the end of this, they are, they are just marginalized and not important for anything else but a recruiting tool. So there is some back and forth there. Uh, some of the Israelis will say there's no difference between al-Qaeda and Hamas. Um, certainly, they're on the receiving end, so it's not a terribly difficult thing for them to expect. And some of them, including Israeli generals, have said it to me very, very much with the issue of trying to convince me. Um, but there are some differences, and um, some of them are there. Al-Qaeda very much objects to participation in elections. Hamas participate at least in one election. They haven't held a lot of elections since then. But um, it's, uh, Hamas has uh, acted like a political party. And, you know, they're sort of saying, why are you acting like Mayor Daley when you're supposed to be leading a revolution? You're leading people, not following people. You're a vanguard. You're not providing services. And so if you're dependent on popular opinion to carry out a revolutionary program, that, that can be very much undermined. Elections are not acceptable. You don't have any business participating in them. And that, that's the Al-Qaeda critique. Um, Hamas has accepted long-term, in some cases very long-term, um, ceasefires with the Israelis, discussions of prisoner exchanges, all sorts of things. And that's not the Al-Qaeda way. The Al-Qaeda way is keep fighting and keep fighting and keep fighting and then you'll achieve martyrdom. And if you don't achieve martyrdom, keep fighting. This idea of ceasefire, why are you having a ceasefire? They're the enemy. Uh, we're not having a ceasefire. Uh, so, so that's sort of out there too. And then if there's really something, you know, that in Al-Qaeda's mind makes the uh, Hamas people total wimps, they have an Israeli prisoner. I keep seeing his name now in the Israeli papers as sergeant. Um, uh, and uh, he was Corporal Shalid, but uh, I guess they promoted him in, you know, uh, on a normal schedule because he's been a prisoner now for four years, and Hamas is trying to bargain with him, and they're doing an effective job. They may get hundreds of prisoners in exchange for him. Uh, there's been a mass demonstration within the last couple of weeks uh, outside uh, the Prime Minister's, uh, I believe it's outside the Prime Minister's residence, I'd have to check on that, but in any event, um, we closed down, uh, closed down the city for a while, city of Jerusalem. So it's a, it's a, it's it's not a bad strategy from a you know kind of a cold-blooded point of view. You're trying to get your people out of jail, but Al Qaeda, of course, you know you, you don't take prisoners. This is a, this is a jihad. You, this guy should be killed. I mean, so you have that kind of uh, that kind of criticism too. Uh, ultimately, then. The other thing is, is that all these weaknesses, Al-Qaeda suspects that Hamas will ultimately, ultimately end up stabbing them in the back. They've already, they've already um, talked about unity with Fatah. Fatah talks to Israel. They are afraid that uh, ultimately Hamas will talk to Israel, and this will be seen as stabbing the Palestinian people in the back by Al-Qaeda. Therefore, the hostility between these groups is at this point white hot. Um, as ugly as Hamas is, which is, and it's very ugly in my opinion, you got worse out there. And that has to be something that a strategic thinker considers. Um, 
the one thing that ha that, that's kind of hopeful in terms of limiting Al-Qaeda's influence is that um, you got worldwide jihad as, a, as this slogan, like I say, and then the uh, Palestinians don't want their issue to be secondary to, you know, whether or not you can change the whole world and install bin Laden as the caliph. Okay, conclusion. I ha do reach a conclusion. Um, negotiations to manage are vital. Uh, even if you're not going to get comprehensive results, if you can stave off problems, if you can contain problems, those are good. Um, and as I say, and as I've made a, a central point of this talk, multidimensional issues also remains policy important for policymakers to be aware of the domestic problems of these states. If you're asking them to do things that look pretty hard for them to do domestically, chances are it's going to be a big problem for them. Okay. Um, second set of conclusions, and this should be almost my last slide, is that um, you have to understand the trade-offs. You can't get everything you want. If you want to push democracy, you might get Hamas elected. And um, decide what you want to do. You did push democracy, by the way, and you did get Hamas elected. So, um, you, you know, you, you can't just reach out to this region with an agenda that doesn't recognize the possible dangerous side effects of some of the things that you feel really important. Um, okay. Also, it may be possible to work with some parties, like Hamas, on some issues, like containing bin Laden, but not on other issues. You know, you might want to look the other way if Hamas is breaking Al-Qaeda heads. But you don't want to look the other way if they're doing a lot of other types of, types of things that uh, more directly impinge on American interests. So all of these things have to be considered. Okay, I've got, uh, for further information, I'll let you look at the slide while we're talking the questions. I've gone into a few too many anecdotes. So this has been longer than when I rehearsed it, but we have a few minutes for questions. So uh, please feel free. Yeah.